all this is dr mobin sayed from drbean.com welcome to one more show so vigovi ozempic semaglutide there is a lot of mixed bag um outcomes that we are seeing there are some people who are very happy with it there are some people who stopped reducing weight ogovi is what we're talking about and then there are some who stopped the drug and the weight came back there are actually news that weight came back even more than what it was before and secondly there are studies that are showing that even the cardio protective effects can come back once the drug is stopped so I wanted to make sure that we can look at the mechanisms of this drug and try to understand why the side effects and try to understand why the benefits are reversed once we stop the drug i see a lot of videos on youtube which present the mechanisms in a brief summary or the side effects briefly but there is no exhaustive complete look into this drug and its mechanisms so i have been pondering over tons of studies and here is the data for you so starting with this one this is drbean.com in the description of this video there is a uh, link which is drbean.com forward slash med nerd. And that is for general public. If you are not a healthcare professional, if you need CMEs, then go to see plans there. But if you're general public, you just are interested in more videos, then I would recommend you start with chronic inflammation and pain management, then go to cardiovascular system and clinical GIT. These are the important topics for all of us to know. Now, I'm going to also start with one more quick news here about the Wegovy. People taking obesity drug, Ozempic and Wegovy gain weight once they stop medication. So here, there is a senior vice president of Novo Nordisk. That is the company which makes these two drugs. And her name is Karen Kond Nape. And there is a very interesting uh, quotation from her. She said, available data suggests most individuals will recover most of their weight within five years of stopping an obesity drug and roughly 50% of their weight after two to three years. Some individuals may actually gain more weight after stopping an obesity drug than they initially lost. Condinape added, studies have similarly shown weight rebound in people who stop taking Ozempic. So with that, just a very quick look at various studies and the links that I have. So this is FDA and their approvals. This is Ozempic weight loss. Does it work? And what are the recommendations? This is semaglutide delay four hour gastric emptying. So what happens is within our stomach, once we are taking these drugs, even after four hours, 30% of the food is still sitting in the stomach, which of course would cause problems. Uh, then here is the metabolic role of vagal efferent innervation. We're going to talk about that today and a bunch of other uh, studies here, which I would, uh, I have the links in the description. So I'm going to stop these, uh, close this, and we are going to go to my um, drawings. So first of all, what are, what is semaglutide? What are, what is Wigovi? What is uh, Ozempic? So these drugs, have a molecule, synthetic molecule, that molecule is called semaglutide, which is a synthetic molecule of a natural hormone produced by our GIT, which is called GLP-1. Now GLP-1, we'll discuss a little more in detail a little later, it is called incretin. Incretin are hormones produced by our lower GIT, that is lower um, distal part of ilium and the large colon or, or the large intestine colon, the lower gastrointestinal system produces hormones to tell the upper gastrointestinal system to say, stop it, we have already eaten enough. I'm, I'm just kind of exaggerating their behavior. They don't really call that out. These hormones are, call, are called incretins. Incretins are GLP-1 and GIP. These are two important incretin hormones. Incretins are hormones that are released when we eat food, and their job is to help regulate glucose. 
So that is the job. And you could say that, hey, we thought that the glucose regulation is insulin. Yes, in cretins can actually affect beta cells of the pancreas to release insulin in a glucose dependent manner. So they trigger, induce insulin release, which the insulin in turn will go and take care of the glucose levels. So in cretins, within the in cretins GLP-1. So keep please that in mind. And as you can tell, we are going to be technical today. I did not see this kind of information present in any of the videos, so I thought it is important for us to see it. So first of all, now in cretins, where are they released from? L cells of the GIT. L cells. So if you see here, this GIT diagram over here, this diagram has three kind of intestine in it. One kind is going to be jujunum. The other majority over here is going to be ileum. And then, of course, this is colon or the large intestine. The L cells are flask-like cells. They're flask-shaped cell that are present in the large intestine and in the distal part of ileum. Distal means farther part. So if you stretch out the ileum, the small intestine, then the later part of the ileum that is in contact with the large intestine, in that area, L cells are present. So here I've made this little L cell. L cells produce a chemical molecule, a molecule that is called proglucagon. They produce proglucagon. Proglucagon is then further divided or cleaved, as we say, it is further broken apart into GLP-1, GLP-2, and other hormones. For us, what is interesting is the GLP-1. So here we have an L cell, this orange one. Imagine that this side is the GIT. You have eaten the food. That food is present here within the GIT. And as that food components of the food, they come in contact with the L cells, L cells would try to understand what is in the food. And based on what is in the food, they would then increase the production of GLP-1. Now, I also want to make sure that we understand that what is in the food, it's not that if you have eaten, let's say, a burger, then in the large intestine, we still have the burger. Of course, the burger has been broken down into smaller pieces. It is now in the form of a paste. When that paste-like uh, nutrition reaches colon and the distal part of ileum, in the colon especially, the, the microbiome, the, the pathogens that are sitting there, or not really path pathogens, they are helping us, these will actually break down fluid into... a uh, uh, the fluid I'm saying, the food into remaining even smaller particles, then those particles would come into contact with these L cells and then L cells will produce GLP-1. That GLP-1 will be released in the blood circulation. Now, please also remember that the GLP-1 is very quickly inactivated. It is very quickly stopped. It is very quickly destroyed. Who destroys, destroys it? There is an enzyme present that is called DPP4. DPP4. DPP4 starts destroying GLP-1. This, this is why GLP-1 has a half-life of two to three minutes. So throughout our day and night, the L cells continue to release GLP-1 that does its function, then DPP-4 destroys it, and then a little later it would release GLP-1 again based on whatever is coming in contact with them. Good? Now think about it. If we take a GLP-1 from exogenous sources, from outside, we have a problem. That problem is that the GLP-1 will be very quickly destroyed. And I haven't yet explained that why do we take GLP-1. This GLP-1 is actually responsible for delaying the gastric emptying, for regulating the glucose level, for producing the feeling of being fed and making us not eat more. That is what Ozempic and, and Wigovi are, GLP-1 synthetic form. So let me go back to the synthetic form. Why do we have synthetic molecule? So if we have from exogenous route, 
GLP-1. So you come over to me with a little bottle and say, here is GLP-1. I want you to take it. The problem is if I take that within two to three, four or five minutes, the DPP-4 would inactivate that. So you're not going to take a drug for four minutes effect. So what they did was Novo Nordisk, the company, they and actually not just that company, this was the molecule created semaglutide, where they modified the GLP-1 in a way that it has become resistant to DPP-4. So because of that, it can stay in our system for a longer period of time. Secondly, they modified the GLP-1 in a way that it can bind with albumin. Albumin is a very abundant protein present in our in our circulation. Uh, albumin, <laughs> I actually think it is the taxi of the circulatory system. It actually carries a lot of various kinds of molecules and carry them around in the blood circulation. So the GLP-1 is modified to be able to reversibly bind with albumin. So now it binds with the albumin and it kind of runs around in the circulation for a long period of time. And that also allows a slow release of the drug over a week. So how does this drug become slowly released and resistant to DPP-4? There are modifications. Those synthetic molecules with these modifications, these are various molecules, for example, semaglutide and liraglutide and uh, others. So again, today we are talking about semaglutide. Semaglutide is synthetic GLP-1 with these modifications. Now, both Ozempic and Wegovy are the brand names for semaglutide. What is the difference between them? Semaglutide was approved in 2017 when it was packaged as Ozempic by Novo Nordisk and it was approved by FDA for regulating type 2 for regulating blood glucose levels in type 2 diabetes mellitus patients that was 2017 so here down here this is Ozempic dosage that you are seeing in 2023 FDA further approved another action for Ozempic, and that was for diabetes mellitus, diabetes type 2 diabetes mellitus patients who also have risk of cardiovascular events, for example, stroke, heart attack, or death from cardiovascular event, they can also use Ozempic. So that means Ozempic now is used for or indicated for or approved for type 2 diabetes mellitus control and for the risk of cardiovascular events in type 2 diabetes patients. Ozempic is not approved for weight loss, although the same molecule is present in Wegovy, which is approved for weight loss. So if somebody gives you Ozempic for weight loss, that is an off-label use. Now, when people were taking Ozempic for diabetes, they noticed that they were losing weight. Their doctors noticed that the people were losing weight. So what happened was the company, Novo Norda, said, hey, maybe we should do some trials on figuring out if the weight loss can be an effect that we can use instead of being a side effect. So they did some more trials and then they went back to the lab and they created a new name for the same molecule. It had a higher dosage that is available. They went back to FDA and in 2023, FDA approved Wegovy, which is semaglutide, as a weight loss drug for overweight and obese individuals. In 2024, FDA then further approved Wegovy for cardiovascular event protection, for example, heart attacks, strokes, and death in obese and overweight individuals. The difference between the pens of these two, um, Ozempic and Wegovy, so let me write here Ozempic and Wegovy. The difference is dose. 
Vigovi needs a higher dose of semaglutide for weight loss. So Vigovi pen is one dose per pen, one pen per week. And the month one, for example, is 0.25 milligram per week. Then month two is 0.5 milligram per week. Then month three is one milligram per week. Month four is 1.7 milligram per week. And finally, 2.4 milligram per week. That is a dose escalation. On the other hand, Ozempic starts with 0.25 milligram, then goes to 0.5 milligram, then one milligram, and then two milligram. That is the dosage difference. Secondly, the Ozempic pen comes with four doses in it. It is pre-filled with four doses instead of one that is in Vigovi. So thirdly, Ozempic pen comes without needles and the needles come separately and you attach them and use them while Vigovi comes with a hidden needle already installed on it. So these are the differences in these pens. Now, how do Ozempic and Vigovi work? My uh, point of view is that we should understand how the mechanisms work and how the side effects occur. And then we can talk with our doctors for having it or not. So there are four main classes. I watch a lot of videos and I think that there is a lack of providing this organization to understand this molecule. There are four main classes of actions that semaglutide performs. Semaglutide, synthetic GLP-1, glucagon-like peptide-1. Number one, glucose regulation. So of course that would be its effect on pancreas and liver, we'll discuss that a little later. Glucose regulation, keep that in mind because if it is doing glucose regulation, then there would be a number of side effects that are related to this class of its action. Number two, delay, delayed gastric, gastric emptying or ileal break. Ileal break. I-L-E-A-L-B-R-A-K-E. -E -E, ileal break. We'll talk more about that too. So slowing down of the GIT. And of course, there are going to be a set of side effects that will be related to this mechanism of slowdown of the GIT, gastrointestinal system, slowdown of your stomach, leaving the food in there for four hours, 30% of the food still sitting in the stomach. What do you think it's going to do? It's going to rot in there. So eventually, the hope is that you would reduce eating food so it would not be left in there rotting. But in the beginning, if you're eating just as usual, then there will be 30% of the food can be sitting in there after four hours. So there, is gonna, there are going to be side effects related to that. Feeling of satiety. Satiety is the feeling of fullness, feeling of being fed. So that is another class of action of these molecules, independent of slowdown of the GIT or not independent of controlling the glucose levels or not. This is an independent direct effect on the brain, satiety. And then nausea, how could, you could actually make fun of me right now to say, why would you put nausea as an action instead of a side effect? Nausea seems to be a side effect of the drug. Actually, semaglutide works directly on a part of our brain called area postrema and produces nausea as its action. Yes, it is not a desirable action, but it is its direct action. It's not a side effect. It does have nausea as a side effect of the GIT effects. So desired effect on the GIT to slow down the GIT so that we can eat less and we can lose weight. And a side effect of slowing down of the GIT is nausea. So that is a side effect. We didn't want it, but it happens. Similarly, we don't want the nausea to occur, but there is a direct action on area postrema, which causes nausea. So these are the four classes, main classes of actions of semaglutides to keep in mind. Now, side effects. There's a long list of side effects. Side effects do not occur in everyone. Number two, when the side effects do occur, they slowly wane off and the person starts becoming used to them. Some side effects are really, really dangerous and potentially harmful. And so it comes, we go, we comes with a black box warning about the side effects, including thyroid cancer like side effects. So I want to once again, 
do something and that is to classify the side effects in a similar manner as is the action. I have not seen even Vigovi's own website does not divide the side effects into the main action of the class and the side effect related to that. I haven't seen other presenters do that, but I think it is important for us to understand the drug if we can classify and categorize the side effects into their own area. So first of all, we're talking Vigovi now. Nausea, 15 to 30% of the patient, this is the most common side effect. And in the beginning, when the dose is started, nausea occurs more. Then when the dose is escalated, nausea occurs as well, but normally then it goes away. Nausea, 15 to 30% of the individuals. Diarrhea, 10 to 15% of the individuals. And vomiting, 5 to 10% of the individuals. This is a, these are the three most common side effects. What do you think these are related to? Nausea. We talked about nausea as a direct action as well on area postrema. So if you forget that for a second, nausea, nausea, diarrhea, vomiting related to GIT effects, right? Belching. Belching. Imagine that you have the food sitting in the stomach for hours. It is The stomach is not clearing out fast enough because it is slow. It is slowed down because of this drug. You're going to have some food that is going to rot in there. We have also reduced the stomach secretions as well as part of this effect of this drug. So the secretions, the acids are less. They're not breaking down the food that fast and that correctly and that completely. So there is some solid food sitting in the stomach that would rot and that would cause belching and, and that kind of a even feeling of fullness. Gas. Gas would also occur for the same reason that the food would stick in the colon for a longer period of time, whatever is left of the food when it reaches in the colon, and that food or those husk of the food will be attacked by the microbiome sitting on there for a longer period of time that would create a lot, lot of gas. So patient would have gas, feeling of bloating, 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 and that is also because of gas and the slowdown of the GIT system. Then constipation and diarrhea. Isn't this interesting that the patient could have constipation and diarrhea? So I'm going to discuss this, that what does that mean? Why would the patient have constipation and also have diarrhea? Renal issues. Why did I put the renal issues here in the GIT system? Because when the patient is losing water, when they are having vomiting and diarrhea, if the patient is a patient of renal issues, then the dehydration can put a stress on kidney, causing kidney damage. Uh, uh, the Vigovi site says even kidney failure. So that is why I put that over here in GIT um, class of side effects. Stomach pain, of course, gastritis. When the food is sitting in the stomach for a longer period of time, that is going to irritate the stomach and gastritis would occur. Stomach flu, why would stomach flu occur? Because the stomach is not producing as many or as much of the acid because acid secretion also reduces. Number one. Number two, it is not, the stomach is not churning and spinning as much. So the food is sitting in there with lesser acids to destroy the pathogens. So infection can occur. So stomach flu can occur. Heartburn, of course, as part of the food situation, sticking in the stomach, there can be heartburn that would develop. So gastritis or gastroesophageal reflux disease, then gastroparesis. Gastroparesis is the paralysis of the stomach. So in some patients, the stomach just becomes paralyzed, doesn't even work anymore or, or move anymore, and the food is just sticking in there, and this can become an emergency. So gastroparesis. Uh, ileus, ileus is, or paralytic ileus also is the remaining GIT becoming um, paralyzed or stopped or stalled, etc. So all of these side effects are a class that belongs to GIT slowing down and the reduction in acid production in the stomach. It is actually understandable that this would happen. Next. Next class, glucose regulation. So of course, glucose regulation by the semaglutide is done when the semaglutide goes and acts on the beta cells of the pancreas. It actually acts on the beta cells of the pancreas to release insulin, which is glucose dependent. That is as much amount of the glucose is present, corresponding amount of 
insulin will be released. Semaglutide also acts on the alpha receptors, alpha cells of the pancreas to suppress or reduce the production of glucagon. Semaglutide also works on liver to suppress gluconeogenesis or production of new glucose and it promotes utilization of glucose and uptake of the glucose and storage of the glucose. So when semaglutide is acting on pancreas, which may be already stressed because the patient may be diabetes mellitus patient, their pancreas is already stressed, you kick that pancreas more, it can become inflamed. So pancreatitis can occur. That is a glucose regulation class of action and the side effect of that. Gallbladder issues can occur. Why is that interesting here? So two reasons for gallbladder issues. Number one, when we lose weight rapidly, we produce a lot of cholesterol and that cholesterol will be released through the gallbladder into the GIT. And so the gallbladder is receiving a lot of cholesterol, which will tend to become stones as well. Plus the patient is becoming dehydrated as well, which would also give propensity to make stones. Plus the biliary tree, the gallbladder system and the, the ducts actually develop less activity, just like the remaining GIT is slowing down. When the biliary tree also slows down, then the bile tends to stay within the tree and starts uh, crystallizing and precipitating. So gall stones can occur. And they can also become an emergency. And so look at the Vigovi side to see what are the signs and symptoms of that. For example, the abdominal, upper abdominal pain on the right side or the left side, the pain that goes between the two blades, shoulder blades, or it goes on the front to the back, etc. Plus vomiting may or may not be. So gallbladder issues, pancreatitis, then this is glucose regulation, normally semaglutide does not cause hypoglycemia if given by itself because it produces insulin which is glucose dependent. What does that mean? That means if you have glucose in the circulation, then the, the beta cell would produce more insulin. If you have less glucose in the circulation, then the beta cell would produce less insulin. This is called insulin glucose dependent insulin production. However, if semaglutide is combined with other glucose lowering drugs, then hypoglycemia can occur. Hypoglycemia can occur by itself as well, but the chances are lesser as compared to having it combined with other glucose lowering drugs. So now if somebody has hypoglycemia, what are the side effects of that? Dizziness because brain doesn't have enough glucose, dizziness, shaking because muscles do not have enough glucose to work, sweating, that is what happens with the hypoglycemia, feeling hungry, your body is going to say, hey, eat something, I am hypoglycemic, tachycardia because your body is now handling, trying to handle low glucose levels, so it's going to try to send more blood to various circulation, various tissues to make up for the, uh, for the lower blood. Uh, glucose levels, fatigue, anxiety, blood vision, low blood glucose, sh uh, sugar, blood sugar, irritability, mood changes, slurred speech, drowsiness, lightheadedness, headache, tachycardia, feeling jittery. These are all the side effects of lower glucose levels. Why have I kind of separated them into their own classes? Because you can then handle them in those classes. So if you see any of these, that means glucose levels are low and you need to fix them. If you see the GIT type issues, then you know that it is the GIT slowdown that is causing the problem. And maybe you should take some more fluids and eat less and so on. Renal issues or renal failure exacerbated by vomiting and diarrhea causing dehydration. Then retinal issues, the, the vision can become a problem, can have a problem. Tachycardia, increased heart rate, depression or suicidal thoughts can occur, allergic reactions can occur, uh, sore throat can occur, uh, runny nose can occur. Now the bigger one, thyroid cancer's potential, and I have taken the picture from the Vigovi site, so you can actually see what they say. 
So we go, we may cause serious side effects, including possible thyroid tumors, including cancer. This is coming from the Vigovi.com. Tell your healthcare provider if you get a lump or swelling in your neck, hoarseness, trouble swallowing, or shortness of breath. All of those are because when, if there is a thyroid cancer, that would create a mass effect. That mass effect would mean there will be pressure on the trachea and the pressure on the esophagus. So if I push on my trachea right now, I can't speak well. This is what's going to happen. So the patient would have hoarseness of voice, they would have difficulty speaking, difficulty swallowing, shortness of breath because the, because the trachea is pressed. There may be symptoms of thyroid cancer. These may be symptoms of thyroid cancer. In studies with rodents, rodents, there is no data yet in humans. It's a relatively new molecule being used in this way. In studies with rodent, Wigovi and medicines that work like Wigovi caused, caused thyroid tumors, including thyroid cancer. It is not known if Wigovi will cause thyroid tumor or a type of thyroid cancer called medullary thyroid carcinoma, MTC, in people. It's not known. That data is not available yet. There's a question from Christine, why thyroid affected? Because thyroid also have GLP-1 receptors on it. So it seems like, they, they do not know the exact mechanism, but it seems like Wigovi kind of kicks the thyroid cells to come into action. And as part of that, the extra activity, they might develop cancer, but the, the mechanism isn't clear. So the right answer to you is, I don't know. Do not use Wigovi. If you or any of your family have ever had a type of thyroid cancer called medullary thyroid carcinoma, MTC, or if you have an endocrine system condition called multiple endocrine neoplasia syndrome type 2 or MEN2. Do not use Wigovi if you or any of your family have ever had a type of thyroid cancer called MTC, or if you have MEN2. You have had a serious allergic reaction to semaglutide or any of the ingredients of Vigovi. You have to give me one second. I need to open the door for Luffy. He is here. He was sleeping. I want to go out. So one second. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Luffy is out. So side effects. Now the mechanisms. I have to kind of connect the mechanisms. First, I have to explain the mechanisms, then we'll connect the mechanisms to the side effects. So first of all, hypothalamus. This is now the, the um, delicate territory. So if you're not a healthcare professional, if you're not a medical nerd, if you're not a medical student, you can just stop here because we've talked about the drugs. Now I'm going to go into the detail of the mechanisms. So how does it work? So the first one is hypothalamus. GLP-1 glucagon-like peptide, when it is released, it goes to GIT itself and acts on it. The receptors for the GLP-1 are present in many places. They are present on kidney, they are present in the, in the gastrointestinal tract, they're present in lungs, heart, thyroid, and of course, brain. In the brain, there is a special area called hypothalamus, the one that I am kind of trying to highlight over here. Hypothalamus has receptors for GLP-1. Similarly, look at this other area where I'm kind of highlighting. This is called area postrema. This is the lower back of the medulla oblongata, area postrema. These two areas have GLP-1 receptors. GLP-1 receptors are present in other areas too, but these are the two that imp are important for us. In the hypothalamus, in the hypothalamus, there are centers that are responsible for energy balance. So I'm going to stop sharing for a second and, and <laughs> have a talk directly. So in the hypothalamus, there are clusters of neurons that are responsible for energy balance of our body. What, do, what does that mean? Hypothalamus receives information, for example, temperature of our body. Remember, there's a hypothalamic thermostat that can become changed 
when we are infected and interleukin-2 goes and acts on that and the temperature changes and we get fever, that is hypothalamus. Hypothalamus knows the body's temperature. Because it knows the body's temperature, it knows how much energy we are burning. Similarly, when we produce insulin, that goes to hypothalamus and tells that, that, hey, I'm here. And insulin production actually means there is glucose in the body. Similarly, there is another hormone called leptin that comes from the fats and that goes to hypothalamus as well and says, hey, new fats are being formed. I'm here. I'm leptin. I'm telling you that we have fats. Similarly, GLP-1 goes to the hypothalamus as well and says, hey, we have nutri nutrition in the GIT. So I'm here to tell you that we have food. Similarly, the parasympathetic system, the vagus nerve, vagus nerve have sensory part. The parasympathetic system has a sensory system that brings information from our viscera's, from our organs to hypothalamus to tell the hypothalamus how the viscera's are doing. For example, when our stomach has food in it and it is stretched with food, vagus nerve would bring message to hypothalamus to say, hey, we are full with the food. When the colon has lots of nutritional things in it and the stools are forming, the GLP would go to the hypothalamus and say, we got food, we got stools. Hypothalamus's job is to integrate all of that to say, Okay, this is a human being of this size, this volume, and it needs this much energy. And I see that there are signals that glucose is here. There are signals that leptin, the, the fats are here. There are signals from the colon that the stools are here. That means there is food being eaten. The stomach is also sending me messages for being stretched. And I also know the temperature of the body. So I know what, what energy is being spent and what energy is available. I can now decide if the person should continue to eat more or not. So hypothalamus has a nucleus which is called satiety, which is ventromedial nucleus. Ventral means front and medial mean on the middle side, middle side. Ventromedial nucleus that is responsible with satiety. Satiety is the feeling of fullness, feeling of being fed. Hypothalamus has another set of nuclei which are called paraventricular nuclei that are also responsible for producing satiety. Interestingly, molecules like GLP-1, for example, semaglutide, liraglutide, etc., they can cross the blood-brain barrier and right at the third ventricle, near the roof of the third ventricle, one of the cavities of the brain, the blood-brain barrier is kind of a little thin over there. So it is easy for these to cross the blood-brain barrier and enter. And right below that is hypothalamus. So GLP enters, the semaglutide enters and tells the hypothalamus what's happening. Hypothalamus then in turn can produce satiety. Satiety is a feeling hypothalamus would produce of being full, being fed and you would stop eating more. So that is one of the actions. I'm going to go back to the, that is one of the actions of semaglutide, which is direct action on the brain tissue to produce the feeling of satiety. Then, this is an important concept, really important concept. And we say it this way, we say that semaglutide has partial action like ileal break. So check here, ileal break, I-L-E-A-L -E break. Ileum is one of the part of the small intestine. So ileal break is the ileum applying a break. I have a little cartoon for that. So look at this, this is stomach and ileum is choking the stomach to say, stop it. <laughs> or this is the stomach and ileum is choking it. So ileal break is a very important concept to understand. What happens is your lower intestine, that is the distal part of the ileum and the large intestine, they together are called lower intestine. Your lower intestine, when that is filled with food, 
it sends a message to the upper intestine, which means your stomach and the duodenum, jejunum, upper part of the ileum. But let's just use stomach as our, as our main target. Your lower intestine sends a message to the upper intestine to say, hey, we are full. We are already processing this food. We have lots of fats and carbohydrates and proteins. Can you please not get more food in? We are busy here. This mechanism is called ileal break. The ileum, the lower intestine, is putting a break on the function of the upper intestine so that we stop eating and stop sending more food to be processed. So, what is the part of ileal break? What are the components of ileal break? The slowdown of the stomach movement the tightening of pyloric sphincter, which is the uh, stomach's outlet, the slowdown of the GIT in general, closure of the sphincters, which would also mean anal sphincter closure, which will mean constipation, reduction in the acid secretions in the stomach, Reduction in the other hormones, for example, coming from pancreas and other parts of the body. That all together is called ileal break. Your lower intestine is telling the upper intestine, the hey, stop, and not only just the intestine, the body. Interestingly, it is even telling your brain. So GLP-1 is released as part of the ileal break and it goes to hypothalamus and says, produce satiety. I want to stop the person from eating more. And do you know, the, I think this would tickle your brain, do you know that the ileal break is produced because GLP-1 is released from the L cells and the L cells produce that because microbiome is breaking down the food into smaller components which then affect the L cells. So the ileal break is not just the GIT doing it, it is actually the pathogens sitting in there that are working with the GIT to produce the break. So microbiome is helping you regulate your food intake. Such an important concept. So GLP-1, that synthetic, har uh, sorry, organic hormone released from the lower intestine is an important part of the ileal break. So if you give semaglutide from outside, it is going to apply the ileal break. So now, how is the ileal break applied? Of course, the lower intestine doesn't have a pedal somewhere to say, all right, break the car. What happens is, there are multiple theories for how this break is applied. One, I'm going to pr provide a couple of theories. One part of the ileal break is the direct action of GLP-1 on the stomach to reduce the stomach secretions. There was a study where they tried to understand that semaglutide, if directly placed or infused on stomach, what will it do? And they saw that the stomach activity was not changed, but the stomach acid secretion was changed. There was some relaxation of the stomach as well, some distension of the stomach, not a lot. So that means direct effect of GLP-1 on the stomach is for secretion only, but not on the motility, not on the gastric emptying. So then... They did another exercise and they saw that the vagus nerve that is going from the stomach to the hypothalamus. If you stimulate the vagus nerve with GLP-1, then the vagus nerve sends a message to hypothalamus and hypothalamus then sends a message back to the stomach to say, stop moving or reduce movement. They did this experiment on the animals whose vagus nerve, efferent vagus was cut. And even when they gave them semaglutide, it didn't work because the vagus nerve is a necessary component for gastric emptying slowdown. Do you know what does that mean? If you're a healthcare professional, what that means is that if somebody who has autonomic dysfunction, semaglutide may not work on them very correctly because vagus nerve is not functioning correctly. So you might, somebody who has autonomic dysfunction, you try to give them semaglutide and you say, well, it's not working. Yeah, because it needs vagus nerve to work. 
Now, how does vagus nerve exactly function on the on the brain stem? There are some research that says that vagus nerve in turn goes and produces GLP-1. Some say that it works directly in the hypothalamus and reduces the parasympathetic outflow, which means the, the GIT would become slow and the sphincters would become tight and that is the action. So not a lot of clarity there, more research is needed. So that is the that is how the ileal break is applied. So here is the ileal break. Imagine colon is choking the stomach, but this, this is just, it is choking the stomach. The whole system, as I mentioned, goes into a break. So when you take semaglutide from outside, that ileal break gets applied. And so would you like to eat more when your stomach is slowed down and it has a bunch of food already present in it and the secretions are not being done and the GIT is slowed down and there is gas being produced and you're feeling bloated? Would you like to eat? No. And your, your hypothalamus is saying, hey, don't eat more. I am The satiation has occurred as well. Satiety has occurred too. So all of those things together make you not eat more. That then causes weight loss. Okay, so next class of actions. We've already done two. Direct action on hypothalamus to produce satiety. Secondly, action on direct GIT and on hypothalamus and on the hormonal systems to produce ileal break. And now the next class, glucose regulation. So as I mentioned before, GLP-1 or semaglutide would go and act on the beta cells of the, of the pancreas and they would produce insulin corresponding to the glucose level. So this is called glucose-dependent insulin production. Semaglutide would also act on the alpha cells of the pancreas to reduce glucagon production. Glucagon is kind of opposite to insulin. The semaglutide also acts on the liver to take up for to ask the liver to take up more glucose and store it as glycogen and produce less glucose or, or suppress gluconeogenesis. So that is the action on the glucose. Then, as I said, satiety induction, we already talked about it. And then the nausea induction. This part, area postrema, lower part of this medulla oblongata, as I said before, that can produce nausea. So now we know the mechanisms. Ideally, I should just stop here. We are 47 minutes into it. Nobody is going to watch this video. And I think this is one of the most important videos for these molecules. But if you are okay, I'm going to add a couple of more mechanisms for um, side effects. So one mechanism that I want to add is the diary and constipation together. So imagine that this is colon and then the anal canal and rectum and anal canal. And I'm just going to short circuit all of that and say, here is colon. And then this is the anal sphincter, right? Now our body's rule is that when GIT is moving fast, the sphincters open up. Think about it. If the GIT is moving fast, do you want the sphincters to be closed? For example, anal sphincter, that will produce a lot of pain because the GIT is moving fast to throw things out. And you have closed the door to throw them out. That would create pain. The sphincters would open and we get diarrhea or we get stools. On the other hand, if the GIT is sluggish and slow, then the sphincters close and we don't get diarrhea or we get constipation. So now think about the semaglutide. What does it do? Semaglutide, semaglutide slows down the GIT's function. That means sphincters will become tightened up. That means the patient will get constipation. Now constipation is understandable. Why diarrhea? So here, imagine that this is colon or let me actually make a little more realistic pipe. So let's say this is ascending colon, this is transverse colon, this is descending colon, then we have rectum and anal canal and anal sphincter. Little more. Now what happens is when the GIT has become slowed down, there will be 
there will be food matter that is now sticking in the colon and it is not moving very much because the colon isn't moving much under the influence of semaglutide. So when it is not moving very much, number one, the pathogens, the microbiome that is sitting over here is going to continue to work on this little husk of the food and produce gas. And number two, the GIT, the colon would continue to pull liquids or fluids out of it, the water out of this food, and the food would start becoming harder and harder. The stools will become harder and harder. Eventually, the stools will become so hard that the, they would not pass, and the patient is now constipated for another reason. Not just that the sphincter is tightly closed, but the, the, the stools are hardened as well. The third problem is that these stools would start getting impacted to the colon's wall. So now we have a perfect storm of constipation. However, the remaining GIT, the remaining GIT, the ileum, the jujinum, the stomach, all of them, and you are still eating food. So you're still pushing food into the system. This food is all watery and it is pasty like food. And it becomes solid when it reaches colon, which would pull the water out. But the colon is already busy. It is already filled with stools. When you try to push I'm going to make it in blue color. When you try to push now fluidy, pasty, liquidy uh, food in the colon and expect colon to pull the water out of it, colon isn't going to do that. So this fluidy things will pass on the side of the solid stools because colon isn't doing its function on this new food because the new food has to stick there to be able to get the water out. But this colon is already filled with stools. So this wall, the small cracks between the stool and the colon, that is where this new food would kind of leak from and end up going out. So what do you think we would get? We would get watery fluid stools. So now this patient has constipation and diarrhea. This is called overflow diarrhea. The other problem is that the GLP-1 hormone or semaglutide, when given in this kind of a quantity, it can actually cause a stooling reflex. Stooling reflex means that the reflex that we have to produce stools when we have eaten food and there is stools that are present and we get that urge to go to the restroom because we have to poop. That is called stooling reflex. GLP-1 can unnecessarily produce stooling reflex in some people, which would then cause diarrhea. So now if I go back for a second and look at the side effects, I think that we can, other than the thyroid and why does the cancer side effect, we can now actually understand why side effects would occur. So if we started from here, nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, I hope it is now clear. Belching, gas, feeling of bloatiness, uh, the GIT is slowed down. The, that is the main function of Wigovi, to slow down the GIT so you don't eat more, so you lose weight. Constipation, diarrhea, we just talked about it. Why constipation? The There are three reasons for constipation. Number one, the GIT sphincters are closed because GIT is slowed down. Number two, the, the water is absorbed and the stools are hardened. Number three, the stools are now stuck to the sides of the walls, which is called stool impaction. All of that would cause constipation. Then there is less water because a person has been vomiting and that would cause constipation. Stomach pain food sitting in the stomach. So there is a study that showed that in women, obese women with PCOS, they gave them Ozempic or yeah, Ozempic. This is 2023 study. And the four hours after taking the Ozempic, these women's stomach still had 30% of the solid food sitting in it compared to the placebo where there was 0% food sitting in the stomach after four hours. So of course that's plus the acid secretion is reduced. So the digestion is going to not work very well. The killing of the pathogens would not work very well. So the infections would occur, the gastritis would occur, the pain would occur, the belching, the gas, all of that would occur. Now I have to say this, that this doesn't mean 
that this drug doesn't work, it is 15 to 30 percent people have, for example, nausea. Then the nausea goes away. Then 10 to 15 have vomiting, for example, or 15 to 10 to 15, yeah. And then that goes away. So it's not that they would always have it. Some people would have really serious side effects, but not majority. So this is the discussion. I wanted to make sure that the Uzumpic and semaglutide and Wigovi related concepts are all in our grasp because there are so many videos and there is so much misinformation in those videos, uh, both for the action and for the side effects that I thought it was important. That is why you come here <laughs> to Dr. Bean to understand the mechanisms. So this is the discussion. Thank you very much. I know it's a long video. I know people are not gonna really watch it, but this I think is the most comprehensive talk about this molecule, semaglutide. Um, Please do me a favor, look at uzumpic.com to understand more, look at wegovi.com to understand more, and like, subscribe, and share this video. And if you would like to have more medical lectures, go to drbean.com and get those lectures as well. Thank you. I would see you next time.